Hi, I'm Matt Payne, and welcome to 20th Century Revolutions. Episode 1.5, The First Hellenic Republic, The Greek Revolution, Part 3. So I want to start this episode by giving a special thanks to all of you out there who have been subscribing to the podcast and leaving reviews and ratings on Apple, Spotify, and whatever platforms you happen to be using. And then a big, giant thank you to the early Patreon supporters. You know, when I was first hatching the idea for this podcast, I was not really sure that anyone at all would listen, so the fact that I am already seeing such positive response is really amazing, and I just want to let you all know that I really appreciate the support. It means a lot. And if you are just now tuning in for the first time and you're liking the content, I encourage you to subscribe, follow, leave a review, share the podcast with other folks who you think might like it. And if you do want to support financially, you can sign up for Patreon or do a one-time donation. All this can be found in the podcast description as well as on the website, 20thCenturyRevolutions.com. Every little bit of support in whatever form does make a huge difference, especially when we're just starting out. I really appreciate all of you, and I'm having a ton of fun doing this so far. So now let's get on with the show. By the fall of 1821, the Greeks had done the impossible. Within a short six months, they had driven out nearly all of their Turkish overlords out of the Peloponnese, and they now held not only the predominantly Christian countryside, but most of the fortified towns and cities as well, with the biggest prize of all, the regional capital of Tripolitza. After taking Tripolitza, however, the fight in the Peloponnese, as well as in mainland Greece, and in the Greek Isles had all settled into a sort of bloody stalemate. After the early gains on the part of the Greeks, the war would continue for years without either side being able to deal a decisive blow against the other. The Ottomans would prove unable to subdue the Greeks of the Peloponnese, while the Greeks themselves could not muster the necessary force to make significant gains outside of their initially won strongholds. There were even a string of fortresses in the Peloponnese itself that would remain under Ottoman control with the Greeks consistently unable to fully drive the Turks off the peninsula. There were many reasons on both sides why the stalemate set in, and these conditions would cause the Greek War of Independence to drag on for much longer than anyone suspected that it would. On the part of the Ottomans, the inability to subdue the revolt can be attributed to broader issues plaguing the empire as a whole during this time. Namely, that the empire was a complete mess. To begin with, the Sublime Port had been running deficits since the late 1700s, which limited their ability to grow the imperial army. This meant that the sultan had to rely increasingly on regional leaders, the pashas, to provide armies for him. This system worked fine when the loyalty of these pashas was assured. However, as we saw with Ali Pasha last episode, these forces could just as easily be turned against the sultan should one of these leaders feel their interests no longer aligned with Constantinople. In fighting the Greeks specifically, the imperial leadership of the sublime port had to rely heavily on Albanian conscripts to fill their rank and file. These Albanian soldiers were completely lacking in motivation, as they were typically most loyal to their local leaders, such as Ali Pasha, who was himself an Albanian. This loyalty stemmed less from ethnic solidarity, though that did play a part, than from the fact that regional chieftains and pashas could, you know, actually pay their soldiers. This created a situation where the sultan was essentially cobbling together several different armies with almost no coordination between them, and just as often, these pashas would be rivals with one another, trying to undercut each other's plans and just generally trying to stab each other in the back any chance they got. Because their armies out in the provinces were so unreliable and even potentially traitorous, The Sublime Port was also hesitant to send its navy too far from Constantinople. The Sultan wanted to keep the navy close to home in order to protect him because he was constantly paranoid about a future war with Russia, because nothing would bring things crashing down upon them quite like another war with Russia. Ominous foreshadowing. On top of all of this, 
Many of the best sailors that the empire did have were in fact Greeks. So throughout 1821 and 1822, these Greek sailors began falling like dominoes over to the revolution, adding an additional hit to the sultan's already fracturing navy. The weakening of the navy and the hesitancy to draw ships outside of the orbit of Constantinople meant that sea battles were much more evenly matched and that the limited number of ships were not properly supplying the forts that Ottomans still held on the coast of Greece and in the islands. Now, I don't want to overstate these deficiencies on the part of the Ottomans. The Greeks were still up against an immense foe, a centuries-old empire with resources and manpower at its disposal that dwarfed what the Greeks could muster. We're still talking about, like, a Labrador facing off against, say, a mid-sized puma. The odds are not great. So the fact that the rebels were able to win the Peloponnese within just a few months was nothing short of a miracle. And the Greeks had their own internal problems that would plague them throughout the war and leave them unable to win the kind of outright victory that would be able to bring the sultan to the negotiating table and allow independence to be officially recognized. Interestingly, the problems facing the Greeks had many similarities to those facing the sultan, albeit on a much smaller scale. Like the Turks, the Greeks had a lot of trouble coordinating their efforts, because their forces were being led by a hodgepodge of different authorities. You have the cleftic warlords, such as Kolokotronis, then the agents from the Felicia Tyria, like Demetrios Ypsilantis and Papaflesas, and finally we have the elite Greek notables. Even though these bands would come together to fight certain campaigns, their typical state of being was really most defined by like fractious infighting and petty squabbles not only between these three different groups, but also within each of these specific groups as well. In many ways, the problem of internal division was even worse for the Greeks than it was for the Ottomans. The Turks at least had the sultan as a figurehead with a lot of historic authority to fall back on, whereas the Greeks only at this point had like this vague sense of national unity that more often than not took a back seat to personal and regional interests. To sum it all up, the Cleftic war chiefs, the Felicia Tyria, and the Greek notables all had conflicting goals in mind. To start with the Tyria, they mostly wanted everyone to recognize their shared Greek heritage, always being like, guys, let's just all be friends, then we can form a national government with a central administration and a centralized military hierarchy. Though the problem with all that was that figures like Demetrios Ypsilantis very much expected to lead this government, and both the clefs and the Greek notables saw Ypsilantis as basically a national dictator in disguise, and therefore as a major threat to their regional power bases. And now, turning to the clefs and notables, besides equally distrusting the Felicia Tyria, hating their Turkish bosses, and then, you know, sharing the Peloponnese as a home, the clefs and the notables really had like nothing else in common, as there was major class antipathy between them, with the notables wanting to maintain the status quo after the revolution, you know, keeping their wealth, land, and privileges, with the notables, of course, feeling like they should be the ones to step in to govern once the Ottoman yoke had been thrown off. The clefs, for their part, largely wanted to disrupt the economic grip that the notables held on the Peloponnese in order to grow their own power bases. And even as the clefs rose in importance after their military successes, the notables still looked down upon them as their class inferiors, thinking of them as nothing more than like highway robbers or guns for hire. On top of all this, You then had the rivalries between each individual cleftic leader, which often resulted in skirmishing, and finally you have deeply entrenched dynastic rivalries between the different elite Greek notables. This is all to say that the Greeks of the Peloponnese would have a good deal of trouble getting along early on. But, you know, the one thing that all of these groups could agree on the clefs, the notables, and even the etaria at times, was that they were all most interested in plundering. 
The loyalty of soldiers stemmed from the ability of warlords to pay their armies well, and this pay invariably came from the spoils of war. The clefs, the notables, and the leaders of the Atiria had armies whom they paid by pillaging cities and villages, robbing and displacing not only Turkish Muslims, but at times Greek peasants as well. What all of this came down to was a situation in which what the Greeks needed most was a coordinated military effort, but they lacked any central authority that could offer this type of coordination. This lack of unity did have hidden strengths, though, as it made it hard for the Ottomans to deal a decisive blow against the rebels. The Ottomans might take out one powerful chieftain, but that just left dozens of other chieftains to deal with who were all hidden up in the hills. The Greek bands also became experts at guerrilla warfare, deploying highly effective hit-and-run attacks, often at night, under the cover of darkness, making full use of their deep knowledge of the terrain. From the outset, the sultan sensed his own weaknesses as he faced off against the Greeks, and he therefore often used draconian punishment against Greek Christians across the entire empire as a strategy meant to defeat the will of the Greek insurgents. This took the form of state-sanctioned pogroms against Greek communities in which thousands of civilians were robbed, displaced, and massacred. At the end of last episode, we saw how thousands of non-Christians in Tripolitsa were massacred when the city was finally taken by the Greeks. The massacre at Tripolitsa was simply one part of a bigger phenomenon gripping the Ottoman Empire with the onset of insurrection amongst the Greeks with atrocities and counter-atrocities committed by all sides spreading widely throughout the empire. In this way, the Greek Revolution represents a brutal precursor to the ethnic cleansings that will truly reach an unimaginable level in the 20th century. This inter-ethnic violence really began to reach absurd and truly terrible levels with the Constantinople Massacre of 1821, which we briefly touched upon in episode 1.3. Almost immediately after news reached the Ottoman capital of the invasion from the Danubian principalities, and then shortly thereafter of the revolt in the Peloponnese, the Ottoman authorities ordered the arrest of prominent Greeks in Constantinople. The most important of these leaders was the ecumenical patriarch, the head of the Orthodox Church. The patriarch was accused of taking part in the planning for the revolt, though he truthfully responded by saying that he had had no part in the insurrection. Nonetheless, the sultan wanted revenge on the patriarch for being unable to prevent the revolt from breaking out, and he ordered him to be executed, even as the patriarch was consistently professing his loyalty to the sultan. After the ecumenical patriarch was killed, several other important Greek leaders were also executed, and these executions basically gave the signal to begin a reign of terror against the Greeks. So, mobs began to form, often led by Janissary units, and they began roaming the city, looting and burning churches and indiscriminately killing Greek residents. The Ottoman imperial government encouraged this behavior as they continued to arrest and publicly execute prominent Greeks, seeing this as revenge for the uprisings, even though the vast majority of those killed had nothing to do whatsoever with the revolt. Similar massacres then spread throughout the empire, and as Greeks fled these reprisals, a refugee crisis ensued. And as news of this anti-Christian violence spread to areas currently consumed by the revolution, such as the Peloponnese, violence against Muslims heightened even further, most dramatically seen in the Tripolitsa massacre. And so the cycle of atrocities and counter-atrocities began to take hold. The sultan's strategy of draconian repression largely backfired as it meant that these refugees escaping the violence were pouring into the Peloponnese, carrying with them tales of Ottoman violence against Christians. This signaled to the rebels that if they ever surrendered, they would likely become the victims of ethnic genocide, and this had the unintended consequence of hardening their resolve, and it brought them together in their shared hardships. 
the murder of the ecumenical patriarch in particular was especially galvanizing for the Greeks, and it gave them a Christian martyr to rally around. All of this violence against Christians created solidarity amongst the Greeks, and in many ways, Early Greek nationalism actually grew out of the shared experience of just simply having to face Ottoman violence perpetrated against them as a group. Yet, even as solidarity was beginning to increase amongst Greeks as a whole, and even as the rebels were seeing early military success in the Peloponnese, the core problem of a lack of centralized authority needed to carry out coordinated campaigns against the Ottomans still remained. This was most clearly evident in the fact that as the stalemate between the Ottomans and the Greeks set in, intense politicking amongst the Greeks commenced as many different factions sought to come out of the conflict as the principal revolutionary authority. Within this struggle, the man who would prove to be one of the few leaders with real political acumen was a bespeckled and brainy Phanariot Greek who became known for his snazzy dressing in the Western European style and for the fact that he had no real military experience to speak of, facts that made him stand out amongst the other war-hardened revolutionaries who had come to derisively call him Four Eyes and Foreigner. This is Alexandros Mavrokordatos, a man who would, in just a few short months, be elected as the president of the first provisional government of Greece. Alexandros Mavrokordatos had grown up in an elite family hailing from the Danubian principalities, the area the Ypsilantis brothers also called home, and where the older Ypsilantis had staged his failed revolt. Mavrokordatos came from the same elite ruling class of Phanariot Greeks, and he served as chief minister for his uncle, who ruled as prince. Unlike Demetrios Ypsilantis, the younger brother who had come down to the Peloponnese and attempted to immediately take over the revolution, Mavrokordatos had, you know, like, real political abilities that would allow him to quickly rise in importance. He, for example, knew that one should not waltz into the Peloponnese like Ypsilantis, and tried to declare himself like Prince of the Greeks, even though he was only just now seeing the Peloponnese for the first time in his life. When the revolution broke out in early 1821, the 30-year-old Mavrokordatos was living in Pisa alongside the English author Mary Shelley, who had actually just finished her Gothic masterpiece Frankenstein, along with her husband, the famed poet Percy Shelley. Mavrokordatos had deep connections to the post-Napoleonic world of European Romanticism. As we will see, these connections to the cosmopolitan and increasingly international European intelligentsia would prove key to the later success of Mavrokordatos. Upon hearing of the revolt in the Peloponnese, Mavrokordatos decided that he had to leave Pisa and join the action, even though many of his confidants urged him against this decision. So, ignoring these warnings, Mavrokordatos boarded a ship headed for Patras, a city on the far north of the Peloponnese. When the ship neared its destination, however, they learned that Patras had actually not yet fallen to the rebels and was still actually under Ottoman control. With this new intel, the ship decided to land instead in the nearby town of Missolonghi, which is actually not on the Peloponnese, but is instead on the very southwest of the Greek mainland. Mavrokordatos landing in western Greece instead of on the Peloponnesian peninsula would prove to be one of the most important factors contributing to his meteoric rise, and it was, like so many turning points in history, a complete accident. Because he arrived on the Greek mainland, Mavrokordatos avoided being immediately thrown into the fractious politics now taking place in the Peloponnese in the summer of 1821. As we saw with Dimitrios Ypsilantis, who had himself arrived in the Peloponnese around this same time, the clefs and the Greek notables, who had just driven out the Turks, 
had like no interest at all in submitting themselves to an uppity Fenariot prince from Romania. Had Mavrocordatos made it to the Peloponnese, he may have faced the same fate as Ypsilantis, being forced into ever-increasing obscurity by the rivalrous armed factions. But this was not to be his fate, and Mavrocordatos instead landed in western Greece, which largely lacked the presence of prominent Greek notables who might feel threatened by his arrival. Western Greece was much poorer than the Peloponnese, and because it was the old stomping ground of our old friend Ali Pasha, the population was much more ethnically mixed without the clear Greek-Christian majority that defined the Peloponnese. The region was primarily run by Greek chieftains known as the Armatoles. The Armatoles had a lot in common with the clefts of the Peloponnese. However, they were much more powerful due to the relative lack of wealthy Greek notables, and their rule was hereditary and dynastic, stretching back for many generations. Even though they were Greeks, these Armatoles were part of the group historically known as Ali Pasha's men, and at this moment they found themselves in the middle of a kind of tug-of-war of competing interests all fighting for their loyalty. To the south, their fellow Greeks were up in arms, driving out the Turks. To the north, Ali Pasha was actively fighting a civil war against the Sultan. The Greeks, Ali, and the Sultan all expected the Armatoles to pledge their loyalty to each of them respectively. With all of these conflicting loyalties, this was an incredibly fraught and potentially deadly game for the Armatoles, and so they were initially much more hesitant to declare their allegiance to the Greek cause than were the clefs. It was within this world of competing interests that Mavro Cordato set to work with the goal of convincing the Greek Armatoles that they should choose the Greek cause over siding with the Sultan or with Ali Pasha. In pursuing this goal, the political abilities of Mavro Cordatos would really begin to shine as he was able to quickly bring together several different chieftains powerful in the area with the goal of establishing some sort of central administration. Now, what was most important to the success of this effort to build a central government was the fact that Mavro Cordatos did not initially declare himself the leader of this administration, and in the initial constitution, he pointedly avoided any reference to the Feliki Etiria, of which he was a member, but which he rightly suspected would put off these leaders who desperately clung to their regional authority and who would see the organization as a threat to their power. Instead, Mavro Cordatos went out of his way to assure the Armatoles that they would retain their regional power bases. But he also specifically stated that the Armatoles would be required to obey the orders of the administration and to even provide troops when it was requested of them. Mavro Cordatos was able to get the Armatoles notorious for their regional rivalries, to sign on to this agreement for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, Mavro Cordatos, as we just saw, made no reference to himself or to any specific person whatsoever in establishing the power of the administration. Then, the fact that Mavro Cordatos was a foreigner actually helped him because he was basically an unknown entity in the region. For this reason, the Armatoles were willing to sign his document because he seemed much less threatening than like the other Armatoles. Through all of this delicate political maneuvering, the crafty Mavro Cordatos was able to do what almost no other leader had been able to do. Successfully convince regional warlords to agree that they would obey a civilian administration. In doing this, Mavro Cordatos was making use of his knowledge of Western political theory, in which the government would not be ruled by individuals through the force of arms, but rather by an abstract civilian administration. This was quite a feat for a man who had stepped foot on the Greek mainland just a few days earlier. Even with this somewhat incredible accomplishment, Mavro Cordatos still knew that regional power was the key to success within Ottoman Greece. 
With this in mind, Mavrocordatos simultaneously began making alliances with local chieftains, laying the groundwork for his power base in western Greece. Perhaps even more importantly, though, Mavrocordatos also began to court the leaders within the Greek Isles, whose access to ships and international trading ports Mavrocordatos rightly predicted would become immensely important. As the war progressed, this would prove correct as the influence and power of the Greek islanders would grow, and the alliance between them and Mavrocordatos would begin to offset the power of the notables and the clefts of the Peloponnese. As he cultivated these alliances, Mavrocordatos would continue his efforts to establish a central administration for the Greek cause throughout 1821. These efforts would reach their culmination at the end of the year when he brought together the first national assembly. Mavrocordatos was instrumental in bringing this assembly together as he used his power of persuasion to get other leaders to see the need for some sort of central administration. After nearly a year of messy warfare, many leaders across Greece were beginning to see the benefits of a nationally coordinated effort, and so many agreed to join this assembly. So, in December of 1821, regional leaders from the Peloponnese, the Greek mainland, and the Greek islands came together to form the first national assembly that would have as its goal the representation of all Greeks. Important leaders of the Felicia Tyria, such as Demetrios Ypsilantis, attended, as did powerful Peloponnesian clefs like Kolokotrones. Mavrocordatos presided over the assembly, and by the end of deliberations, he was elected as the president of the first provisional government. Mavrocordatos was able to secure this appointment for many of the same reasons that he was able to quickly rise in western Greece. Namely, that he, unlike Ypsilantis, who was notably sidelined during the First National Assembly, did not openly aspire to establish personalized rule as a prince. Instead, he was simply presiding over a provisional government. Additionally, Mavrocordatos was not seen as very threatening to the notables, Armatoles, and Clefs, because he had no historic authority within a given region that might pit him against other rival warlords. Another important factor, though, was the simple fact that Mavrocordatos was just like a smart dude. He could speak like 10 languages, and he had a lot of knowledge and experience with Western styles of governance. This endowed him with a certain air of authority and made him an indispensable resource for the regional leaders, many of whom were illiterate and had basically no experience with administration. So, with the closing of the First National Assembly, the Greeks began the year of 1822 with a brand spanking new constitution that technically established what we now call the First Hellenic Republic. Now, I say technically, as this government still held very little real power over the regional leaders. But you know, it was a start, and Mavrocordatos had established himself as a vitally important leader within the revolutionary camp as he acted as president of the first provisional government, and also as he continued to grow his regional power base in western Greece. Like I said, he was a smart cookie, and he understood that this was still the real key to power. Even though at this point the central government held little real power, Mavrocordatos recognized that it was an essential component to the cause because he knew that the Greeks needed to at least have the appearance of a rational form of government if they were going to gain the support of European powers. And with all of the accomplishments and skills of Mavrocordatos, his potentially greatest contribution to the revolution would be his ability to court the powers of Europe and to ever so gradually turn public opinion in Europe to become so radically in favor of the Greeks that they could overcome the conservative politics of Metternich and the Holy Alliance. And as we'll see, it will be European intervention more than anything else that will turn the tide in favor of the Greeks. 
because while the Fleeky Etiria had just been straight up lying to everyone that Russia was coming to save them in 1821, the Russians would eventually join the war. And this would be the true turning point that would break the years-long stalemate between the Greek rebels and the Sultan. So, next week, we are going to try to understand how the Greeks were able to create a sensation across Europe that would lead thousands of volunteers to flock to Greece to defend the land of classical ancient Greek heroes. And though these European volunteers would be a bit disappointed when they found themselves not, like, debating with Socrates in the Athenian Agra, but instead in a war-torn peninsula full of unkempt, arrogant, illiterate warlords, the efforts of these volunteers would help the Greek cause, and perhaps most importantly, their stories would be instrumental in turning public opinion in the courts of Europe to be radically in favor of the Greeks, as the Greek cause increasingly became a focal point of European intellectual life within the growing movement of Romanticism winning over artists, musicians, poets, philosophers, and other celebrities of the day. This European cultural sensation that centered around an almost obsessive fascination with the Greeks would come to be known as Philhellenism and its adherents, the Philhellenes. And as the movement swept across Europe, it would have the Italian composer Rossini writing operas decrying Ottoman brutality, the French revolutionary painter Delacroix depicting the plight of enslaved Greeks, the British philosopher Jeremy Bentham offering utilitarian political guidance to the revolutionaries, and even the Duc d'Orléans himself, the Louis-Philippe, future king of the French, showing his sympathies. But the most famous Phil Helene of them all was the English poet Lord Byron, and he would truly take the plunge as he boarded a ship in the summer of 1823 headed for Greece to put his enormous funds and public notoriety behind the Greek revolutionary cause. (laughs) ¶¶ 